Hello, wider listeners. It is once again that time of the week. What time of the week is it? Well, it's that time of the week where we dig underneath the headlines. We find out what is really going on. We give you that deft leftist analysis at the national, international, and very local level. And quite generally, we call out the establishment on its BS. It is the Hood Rat Strategist radio program. Now, as always, the following thoughts, views, and opinions are not necessarily those of 89.1 FM, WIDR Kalamazoo, or Western Michigan University, no matter how dope or insightful they may turn out to be. So uh, we're joined today. We've got uh, two two people from our, our lovely dream team. Uh, we got, uh, uh, what, I forget, William, do you want me to use your, your actual name or your DJ name? Uh, I just go by William for this show okay so what's your dj name uh my dj name is billy walton uh you might recognize my voice i have the show just before this hey yeah. and uh, also uh returning is uh lawrence a uh, longtime co-host yeah the mad lib the other mad lib yeah because <laughs> the yeah. mad lib is uh is our friend luke and yeah. then you got the other mad lib that's me Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and uh, by the way, it's, it's unfortunately we're not able to hear your, your incredible and dope insights uh, through the whole show. You've got to work third shift these days, so we usually get you for about the first half hour. Uh, yeah. So in light of that, um, I think we're going to start the show talking about some, uh, some Democratic Party stuff, specifically the folks running for president. There was a debate <sighs> recently, and there's also a whole bunch of really um, unfortunate uh, news stories slash events probably didn't catch if uh, all you get your news from is the mainstream media. So, um, oh, man, Lawrence, why don't you go ahead and set us up, and we'll we'll tee it off and uh, okay. join on in. <laughs> all right, man. Uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, what was it? Last Thursday we had the debates, um, and uh, I don't know if y'all saw the whole three-hour thing. I caught a good portion of it. Um, the mainstream if you caught the mainstream media's uh story about it uh mostly everybody was saying that mayor pete and better work and joe biden did very well even though that's what that was what that was what a lot of the mainstream media was saying that castro castro was uh castro's career uh career Mm -hmm. and his run is over because he went after mayor pete and went after joe biden in a very vicious way so i'm just gonna i'm just gonna say one thing because i'm most of this discussion i'm gonna leave between you you two guys because i think you both watch more of the debate than i did but just watching Joe Biden's performance and what I did of it, um, you know, it as, was trash. As, yeah, as, <laughs> as a radical socialist, I'm like, you know, screw this this neoliberal warmonger. But as as a caregiver, somebody who works in the healthcare field, I feel like the DNC is committing elder abuse <laughs> by making this man. He's like, he's like, this is the only viable uh, oh, neoliberal centrist God. we have left. And oh no no they was also trying to they're also trying to push if you listen to Bill Maher they're also trying to push a uh, AV cloud boot jar um uh but oh, that's right. but yeah uh that's, dog that's all okay I really had, but no it's, 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 but dog the whole debate first of all the, the the thing I liked about the debate I like the fact that uh just like the last three a large portion of the debate was focused on policies that Bernie's been putting out. It's it. Mm, this is you don't say. This is Bernie. It's Bernie's show. <laughs> Everybody. It is, it is it is Bernie's show. Everyone else's cast members. Okay. It, that's 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 literally what it is. The 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 things that I disliked about it was mostly everything else. Uh, ABC questions were garbage. Absolutely framed from right wing perspective and absolutely trash. Um, Jorge Ramos. I need you to come to the front of the church and take the entire front pew and just and, and quit your job because, God, you suck at your job. <laughs> like, OK, one of the standout questions um, was Bernie Sanders. You uh, you call yourself a socialist. You also want to know what else is socialist? Venezuela. So how are you different? Oh, how are you different from Nicolas Maduro and uh, Venezuela and El Salvador and Nicaragua? And I'm sitting here like. You are a journalist, and your 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 entire uh your entire 
idea in philosophy. Okay, oh, oh my, I'm looking at Jorge Ramos and I'm looking at, and I'm and I'm thinking just long and hard and I'm like, you're in the debates in 2016. You asked them very similar dumb questions back in 2016. And you're telling me in three years you haven't learned a damn thing? Mm, yep. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like you're, you're, you're yeah. telling me that you can't see the difference between what we, what you look at when you look at Venezuela and you say that that's socialism. But when Bernie says, I want to have basically what every other industrialized nation has, kind of like Canada, Finland, Australia, uh, 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 France, Europe, and all those things. You don't see that as socialist. But you see Venezuela as socialist. Not even <laughs> mentioning the fact that we're devastating their country with our tariffs. Not mentioning the fact that our country, that our current administration wants to bomb them because we want to control their oil reserves. Not mentioning any of those factors. But you're using the third grade definition of what socialism is and trying to tie this to Bernie Sanders. Well, like, yeah, I, I think it, it was it, it was infuriating. Yeah. It goes back to that double standard that like, you know, as far as like the capitalist countries, oh, everything has all this nuance and this problem is explained by this, but like if something goes wrong in a socialist country, like, oh, it's because of socialism. Obviously. <laughs> no, I, I, the, the other the other okay, so that so the questions it's like, you know, with, with Flint, you know, people don't say it's like, well, I mean, that's an example of capitalism, isn't it? And actually, it is. It is. It's a much better example of capitalism than the problems with Venezuela are demonstrative of socialism. But I, let's not get I, too off. Yeah, 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 we digress. Um, so a lot of the questions being framed from right wing perspectives uh, was absolutely garbage. Um, you had moments like Amy Klobuchar and uh kamala harris using uh having these fake moments where they thought they were really going to land these zingers like amy klobuchar <laughs> like oh I did see a couple of yeah those. amy klobuchar talking about uh, trying to take down medicare for all like well you wrote the damn bill i read the damn bill um and then saying i think it's bad we need a we need to we need options we need to give the American people options in her and Mayor Pete and Kamala. Everybody's on this thing about options. And I wished, I wish Bernie and Elizabeth Warren would have been like, let's, would have been like, okay, l let me, let me, let me take, take, uh, take this on from your perspective. Mm -hmm. If your house is on fire. If your house is on fire, your kids are burning down uh, and your kids are in the, are in the house. And the fire department comes and says, hey, is your is this fire department plan in your network? Do you uh, uh, you have a you have the Cadillac plan, but your Cadillac plan doesn't cover the basement or your kids room. That's the premium plan. So yeah. so but you have options. You have options. You have options to pay for it. And yeah. then and then it, that's that's the idea. That's the that's the framing that they're taking this healthcare issue because it's like. No, if my house is on fire and my kids are in there, put the fire out and save my kids. If my kidneys are failing and I need help because I have cancer, then give me the help that I need. <laughs> well, it's, it's like they're, well, they're constantly appealing to this, like, uh, you know, middle, mythical, middle class straw man that, you know, well, how would, how would Medicare for all affect the middle class and their options and how much, what if they like their health insurance, which again, who does? But, you know, it, it's funny because like, you know, hearing this, you know, people on our income bracket, you know, when we think of options when it comes to healthcare, it's like, yeah, I would like to have the option to not die because I'm poor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah, I would like to have the option of not going bankrupt because I'm because of because of my asthma. I mean, I had to deal with this uh, a few months ago. So I got so uh, I lost my insurance uh, because um, I was doing a temp job and I couldn't pay for it. So I had to go and get a, Medi a, Mich a Michigan Medicare. Um, and I'm still I still have to appeal it and all this other crazy stuff. But for prime example. My asthma medication, cost, with with the insurance that I had, which was pretty decent insurance, cost three hundred and fifty five dollars every three months. Jeez. Now, now here's the thing. Here's the thing. The manufacturer, AstraZeneca, who manufactures Simbacorp, 
uh, we'll give you a coupon for a year, and that coupon will cut the price in half. So every three months, I usually I uh, every three months before I found before I found out about the coupon, I was paying three three fifty every three months to get my asthma medication. When I found out about the coupon, we used it um, and it cut the price down to a uh, hundred and forty eight dollars. I realized because one of my friends, um, my uh, my ex, uh, lives in Port Huron, and uh, she also works. She also works in the hospital, and she was like, "Yo, did you know in Canada that medicine costs thirty bucks? If you want, I can drive to Canada, grab it for you, and then you pick it up. I could drive to Canada, buy it, and then get get your uh, and bring it back for you, and uh, or you can just." Or the other option was for me to uh, uh, take a weekend, stay at, stay over there, go to Canada, grab it, and come back. Because that would be cheaper than me spending the money to buy it every three months. Mm, yeah. Oh, there's a, yeah. There's a reason that uh, New Deal Grandpa ran a bunch of people over the uh, Michigan border recently. You know. It, yeah. That is it, it's that drastic of a price difference. Dog, I need to I need to holler at them. Real talk, like real talk. I need to holler at them next time they're going across the border. Like yeah. real talk. Like if you know, if you know, if you are listening to this after we posted on uh, on you on Facebook and on YouTube, and you know where people can go to get on the caravan to go get medicine over in Canada, please put it in the description below. <laughs> yeah, because mm-hmm. because it's insane. Okay, so outside of that garbage. Um, uh, Julian Castro being a gangster and uh, and uh, <laughs> completely and utterly utterly eviscerating uh, Joe Biden and and Mayor Pete Mayor Pete calling for civility during a primary. I love the re- <laughs> I love the response. It's like don't be mean to this candidate that we want to face. Uh, literally the mo- the rudest and most a holish president we've ever. Well, Andrew Facts. Jackson, but. Uh, in recent yeah. memory, <laughs> no, no, in recent memory, yeah. yeah, yeah, you you can't handle Julio Castro asking you, did you forget what you just said, and you think Trump's going to be any better? Yeah. Dude, Trump's probably going to call him a child molester when he gets oh in the debate. Oh my god! Yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, sorry, Will. Well, uh, you said you something? hit on something too that, as someone who really likes to dive into campaign strategy, half these people, I don't know what they're doing. They get up there. And a lot of them are trying to preach this middle way between the progressives and Biden. But first of all, all their middle ways are too similar to actually be distinct. But the other thing, they are pushing this idea of party unity as if voting for Kublachar is immediately better than Trump, which admittedly it would be, but facts she's not going to win against trump like we need to have a serious discussion who can beat trump and these people don't want to have that discussion they want to be talking as if this is you know a peacetime election essentially no no, uh is when they when you bring up the facts in the polling nate silver and others tell you that uh, do not believe your lying eyes. There was polling recently that just came out out of Texas. Guess who's beating Donald Trump in Texas by a wider margin than anyone else in the field? Bernie Sanders. Mm. But when you bring that up, like when we saw Crystal Ball bring that up on uh, Bill Maher on Friday, it was all hell broke loose. (laughs) Like like nobody wants to, again, don't believe your lying eyes. Um, well, I think fundamentally, you know, what we all have to recognize when we're watching the media react to poll numbers, you know, vis-a-vis Bernie Sanders, is the idea of a social democrat becoming president is way, it is more unacceptable to the democratic establishment than Trump being reelected. They don't want the general public to know that or to think that, so it, it becomes like this very weird... That's why you see um, a lot of the Democratic establishment being so kind of like bipolar uh, when it comes to Bernie's poll, poll numbers. Because fact of the matter is, it's in their material interests to not have someone like him become their nominee. But they obviously, you know, in order to keep their base, they have to be vocally anti-Trump, even though 
let's be frank, they would prefer Trump get reelected than Bernie become the president. Uh, yes. Or, or and this is also the reason why you see a lot of those establishment Democrats going, uh, warming up to Elizabeth Warren. But at the same time, if you watch, C- if you saw CB, uh, CNBC and a couple of the news anchors on there, they're also freaking out because of Warren. But Warren has, Warren is more um she's not bernie in this in the same sense uh she's she's bernie she's closer to bernie than anybody else but she's not a uh she's not a revolutionary a re- revolutionary she's a reformist and there's a difference there's a yes. strong difference in between the in the in between how and how in your strategy what you were talking about will how will you push these things forward bernie said if Joe Manchin or other blue dog Democrats or people are in the way of sending into progress, I will back primary uh, primaries against them. I will go into their districts and rally the people against them so that we can have change. Warren's not about that life. Warren has actively not been about that life since she a was courting Hillary Clinton's uh, she was having conversations and courting a lot of Hillary Clinton supporters and super delegates uh, over this past week. B, when she was on uh, Bill, Ma- uh, not Bill Maher, on the Young Turks, and she had a spirited defense of Joe Manchin, a man who voted to poison the water of his own constituents mm-hmm. and who votes for Trump, uh, votes for Trump's policy and votes for Republicans more than he votes for Democrats. And uh, C. The other thing that uh, about Warren that's different is that Warren's policies when it comes to foreign policy in the military industrial yes, complex, yes. Mm-hmm. a lot of her uh, and again, this is not on by this is not her fault, but voting for saying that Trump is a, a, a madman and then voting for. Uh, 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 military spending that was more than what uh, Trump, Trump administration, administration asked, asked for shows that you're more concerned. You 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 have a blind spot. You're you have a blind spot because your rhetoric's not meeting your action. So mm-hmm. that that uh, and, but we can talk more about the debates. And I ain't got a lot of time, so I'm trying to get through all this. Yeah. Um, I, I want just one quick point about Warren. Um, I like know, Warren. I, think, I, I yeah. Warren's my number two. I think. Exactly. I think what, yeah, yeah. I think what it boils down to though is like you know whether you like Warren or you like Bernie or you don't like either of them or whatever. The biggest difference between them, and I think the biggest way you can boil it down is you know Elizabeth Warren. You know while they're both like you know want to reign in Wall Street and they have their similarities. Warren is running her campaign like a conventional nominee, like a conventional Democrat, Bernie is running his campaign as a movement organizer. And I think that alone, that's what makes him so scary to the establishment in a way that Elizabeth Warren necessarily isn't. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, Warren seems like she's much more willing to play ball, where Bernie's like, no, you will you will bend to my will. No, it's, it, it, uh, you will bend to my will. You'll bend to the people's we, will. You will, yeah. bend to, you will bend to the people's will, or we will have a problem. Is it? Is the difference between? Um, it's it's the difference between uh, uh, if you saw the Marvels movies. It's the difference between uh, Baron Zemo and Civil War and Thanos. Thanos. <laughs> Thanos. <laughs> Thanos wasn't playing. Like Thanos. Yeah. Thanos ain't playing. We ain't got. I don't have time to to have a middle ground with yeah. you. We are moving. <laughs> either I, you're I going like, to. Either I'm just you're, picturing <laughs> in my head, Bernie's like, you know, once I've collected all of the working class voters. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm right. And then and then the the establishment turns to dust with a snap. <laughs> yeah. Warren Warren is Baron Zemo. She's she's like, no, I will I we will. No, actually, she's more like Loki. Like, yeah, she was working with. <laughs> she she'll work with Thanos. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, but, like you know what I'm but um, but uh, but okay. So we can talk more about the debates, but I ain't got time for that. Uh, there was a story that I did want to talk about. Um, the Intercept has been the Intercept has been dropping bombs. Oh, Tyt yeah. Investigations mm-hmm. been dropping bombs. Uh, 
there was a story about Mayor Pete uh, that came out with TYT Investigates. Ken Klippenstein wrote it, talking about basically uh, when Warren and Sanders is talking about the corrupting influence of money in politics. This is one of the main. This is a great story to talk about it. Mayor Pete. Uh, for those that know the, the story, Mayor Pete fired the first black police chief in South Bend. It turns out, it turns out that there were bl- white racist police officers that conspired to influence the donors of Mayor Pete to make him fire the black police chief. South Bend is twenty six percent black. is a twenty is twenty four percent of black uh, black city. Only. I think uh, I think it's uh, less than six percent of I think it's like around six percent of the police force now since Mayor Pete's been in office is it has black officers Ooh. and um, the story came out. Uh, please go on TYT. Please go to TYT and uh, and read the story. But basically, audio files came out that the wh- these white police officers. We're talking to Mayor Pete's donors and uh, and convince Mayor Pete's donors to have Mayor Pete fire uh, the black police chief. And at first, Mayor, uh, the black uh, when he when he got elected, he tried to fire him. Uh, there was a massive backlash, so he just demoted them. The whistleblower, the white woman that w- was the whistleblower in this situation, she got fired. And then when she filed a uh, a, a wrongful termination. Uh, this information came out, started to come out, but it hasn't gotten national attention because mainstream media loves Mayor Pete, and mm-hmm. and That's is true. it is a fantastic story. Well, uh, well, I'm going to uh, be, didn't uh, Black Lives Matter South Bend? Uh, it, I, they've been like launched a really aggressive campaign, basically telling them like you know come back and be the mayor, like drop out of the race. Yeah, yeah, kind of yeah. yeah. Uh, black because Black Lives because uh, that their organization is basically like no, you need to be accountable for what you did. Yeah. So, so, so if we give if we give the benefit of doubt that Mayor Pete did not know about the manipulation of not only his donors but the white police officers that still work, who are still the police chiefs and the lieutenants in in South Bend, that says it says two. Th- uh, like we're gonna, I'm gonna link link the article and when we post it, but it says two things. One, you're the mayor. They are supposed to listen to you in your direction. You're not supposed to be um, subordinate. Yeah, subordinate to the people who whose job is to protect and serve. For one, two, it goes back to your donors told you to fire a police or police chief, and your excuses, and you've made multiple excuses for it that don't add up. You said that the FBI was doing an investigation of Boykins, which is tr- has tr- uh, proven to not be factually accurate. The person that was the whistleblower, the person that brought up said information, that told it to your attorneys, you also fired. So it seems like you're trying to cover up what you did instead of having transparency about what you did. And the other the other thing that shows is if you were manipulated and, and if, again, giving the, if we give him the benefit of doubt that he did not know. You were manipulated by racist white police officers. <laughs> oh no, let's say uh, you. Yeah. No, no, no. You were you were manipulated by racist white police officers and racist donors. And as of right now, as a, po- a presidential c- uh, candidate, you've taken more big money donors, just as just as much money from big money donors as um, Joe Biden. Yep. And if you're telling us that that money's not going to influence you. They gave you ten thousand dollars and you fired a black police chief. Mm-hmm. I would hate to see what if someone gave you a million dollars, what you would do. And you know it's especially important because our current president is the most overtly white supremacist president we've had in the last seventy years or so. <laughs> so, so yeah, so you have so that story is insane. Um, I linked the Joe Biden story in in our group chat, uh, and y'all can talk about it because I do got I do got get to going. But Mayor Pete. Shows that when we have corruption, this is why I support Wolfpack, wolf com to get uh, get a constitutional amendment to get money out of politics. Th- that story shows. That story shows it. When when you have when you have someone who is easily manipulated by the money that they're getting from big money donors, they will override morality and humanity. 
and ethics for the money while they're supposed to be doing and and uh, while they're supposed while their job is supposed to be protecting and serving and doing the will of the people that they're serving mm-hmm. so like dog dog no nah, dog like it's, it's it's crazy man like mayor p mayor mayor p shouldn't be it shouldn't be in a race kamala can go sit down somewhere uh cory booker can cory booker can Cory Booker is all right. Like that, like he's no, no. I take that. No, I take that back. You can't, you can't, you I cannot. Like to, uh, you can't uh, advocate for bank capital while President Obama was using bank capital as a cudgel to beat over, uh, mm, beat over Mitt Romney's yeah. head. And then you not only advocate for bank capital, you also push charter schools. Yeah. Like, come mm, on, bro. Like. Yeah. No, that's a no go, man. Yeah, um, that's a no for me, dog. That's yeah, a- <laughs> uh, it's like, like I would even see again. I was considering Andrew Yang until I started looking at uh, and, and, like Andrew Yang doesn't support universal free college and tuition, which is a problem for me. My, uh, but the other thing is his freedom dividend, uh, which is a good idea. I do support universal basic income, but his freedom dividend. Would give people less money than if they were using uh, the social safety net. Exactly. So it's yeah. like mm-hmm. if people were using the social safety, if you actually crunch the numbers, mm-hmm. people using the social sh- safety net is better off than uh, Andrew Yang. Andrew Yang giving them a thousand dollars. Now, if he would keep the social safety net the same, and on top of that, mm-hmm. give you a UBI the same way that Kenya. Finland, Australia, and other countries that's done UB, UBI has done, then I wouldn't have a problem with it. I, I mean, you know, I'm so grateful you bring that up because a lot of people will bring that up as a huge positive for Yang. And, like, that's my trepidation with it. I think, like, one of, uh, here's an explicit example. I saw this thread. Uh, somebody posted it, like a landlord Reddit or whatever, and it's like, yeah, if this guy becomes president and gives everybody a thousand, I'm gonna up my rent by like five hundred dollars a month. And it's like, if you don't have that, you know, any protections in place, if you don't maintain, or well, this is America, so you got to strengthen the hell out of our social safety right. net to actually have it provide that kind of a uh, net for everyone. But yeah, like UBI is supposed to be built on top of that. Not as a substitution. <laughs> yes, yeah. and that no, and that's the that's the only thing why I that's one outside of the fact that Andrew Yang's ideas is super libertarian. Like they're super libertarian, and but Yang gang. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a problem with. I don't have a, outside of that. No, no, there's a few other things that I have a problem with with Yang, but <laughs> but on a, on but his idea. Is a good idea. It's just that he's trying to implement it wrong, uh, wrongly. And also, we're not framing the question, the framing the idea of universal basic income in the right way. Um, because UBI is basically social security. It's social security for everyone. Mm-hmm. That's it. And the but the problem that I have is that if you're cutting benefits for those who are disenfranchised but everybody gets a thousand dollars you're saying hey you can use that thousand dollars though it's like <laughs> but i'm still hungry and starving and i don't have transportation to get to work what is wrong yeah, with you yeah. here's like a, here's a thousand dollars go try to figure out a way to get to work in our crumbling infrastructure with right. public transit <laughs> I, I i still i still am struggling to survive like this is not that's 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 not how this works you know what i'm saying there's not there is not a place and it, uh, did like like I was looking at I was looking at I think this is right before I leave because I really gotta go. The, um, it was talking about uh, the living wage in America, and, we're t- and uh, that was nothing that was being talked about. Because um, uh, I don't think Andrew Yang supports a fifteen dollar minimum wage. He says that he will. Uh, there's different ways to get there. This is my problem. There's not a place in America that I, that there's there is less than ten percent of this country where you can live. Off of a living wage and get like a one bedroom apartment in this country. That's right. So it's like, so mm-hmm. like housing, and that was nothing that during the debates, going back to the debates, that pissed me off. Castro, you are HUD secretary. You are HUD secretary mm-hmm. under in the Obama administration. Uh, four blocks away from the HBCU that you are that you were uh, having a debate at is. Uh, housing projects that were being defunded by this administration. 
and you mm. did not say a damn word about it? No. Mm -mm. Yeah. Like, come on, son. Not mm. no one. No one. Kamala and Corey could have teed that up. Mm. Kamala graduated from a, uh, uh, from a, a historical black college. Mm. That Easy. Landslide. Yep. And sometimes the silence, the things that don't get talked about in those debates, speak volumes more than what does. <laughs> they really do. Facts. I think it... Um, place to something I noticed during the debate as well is it almost was and this has been true of all of them, three different debates. You have uh, Sanders and Warren who basically were able to stay on message the whole debate um, speak their mind essentially and then Biden his own separate thing, he has so much baggage that he just has to spend the whole debate trying to explain what and I'd like to say failing to explain why he's not a bad candidate yes. and might I even say a bad person. Oh no no <laughs> he was no he he that answer that he gave about uh, uh, about slavery that oh. answer that he gave us that we have to go but please yeah. please talk about the story about him being the godfather of of the drug war mm. that story needs to be talked about we need to talk about that story more you cannot be to the right of Ronald Reagan and craft. Le uh, legislation with Strom Thurmond and think that black people should still vote for you. Mm. Like, that's not how this works. Not in 2019. No. But I have mm. a black friend and he was the president. <laughs> <laughs> that basically is the Biden campaign. That is Biden yeah. campaign! I have a black friend he was president. <laughs> I'll let y'all. Uh, all right. Progressive versus everybody, man. All right. Thanks for coming <laughs> Thank on, you. Lawrence. Uh, you know, Will, I want to give you a few more moments uh, or minutes. Uh, uh, let's, uh, again, uh, I, I want to make sure you had some, some extra time to keep talking about uh, anything. Any other thoughts about the debates uh, before we kind of take a break and switch gears? Um, really, this is more about Andrew Yang in general than debates. But as we were talking about that, I think Andrew Yang wants everyone to forget that his dividend is an either or. You can take the $1,000 cash, or you can keep your current aid, but you don't get both. And he really wants you to forget that, I think, uh, especially behind the flash, because he is running a very flashy campaign. Um, his one-liners, you know, they got me laughing. They're, he knows how to run a campaign, but it is all flash, and you have to consider the fact that with this going to everyone, and I do support uh, a UBI, but... With this going to everyone and being an either or situation, I don't see how that makes the situation better because yes, everyone gets a thousand dollars a month, but then you have these people who are on aid who have to choose between their existing aid and that. And if they choose that, they're still going to be just as disenfranchised, just as underprivileged compared to the people who already had, you know, what they need and are now getting essentially a thousand dollars extra. Yeah, you know, exactly. And, you know, I think, like, one of the problems with it is, I think, you know, it, it's good to bring up the fact that, you know, and this is something we talk a lot about on the show, even, you know, before Mr. Yang started running, is that, you know, the, the way that the economy is shifting, automation, it's true. There are going to be just less jobs. And uh, even even now, there exists, uh, there's this great book I recommend to everybody. I can't actually say the name of it air, on air, but it's, it's called BS Jobs, and it's the actual word. And it goes into the fact that already today, there exists... Um, a whole class of kind of these bureaucratic jobs under under capitalism that serve no real purpose, have no real uh, tangible, uh, they don't create any tangible difference in the world, but because of the way our economy is set up, where everybody has to have a job, you basically have to create these, these you know, meaningless jobs. Um, you would have, if you wanted to create jobs, there's actually a lot of stuff that needs to be done in this country, you know, fixing our infrastructure, so on and so forth. Uh, um, I can think of, like, a lot of health care jobs that we oh, were desperately needed. Um, but, uh, yeah, again, our, our system doesn't really incentivize that. And, uh, you know, without um, you know going too much into the weeds of this, you know, the big problem is just giving everybody a blank check without actually making any substantial systemic tweaks, yeah, you're going to end up in that situation you just described, where people, yeah, they'll be getting this, this check every month, but they're not going to have the benefits they need to, to have, like, a decent quality of life. Um, you know, uh, again, you know, if you're under our current system, if you're a homeless person um, and uh, you get a check for $1,000 a month, uh, you know, let's say 
you know, all the landlords start j- jacking up their apartment rates. So the cheapest apartment you can find is like a studio for 600 bucks. And then you also have to pay for everything else. Food, clothes, phone, all of your other bills. Um, you basically end up exactly where you started. Um, and yeah, you know, I think that's a, that is a worthy criticism. Because yeah, I think a lot of people say it's like, well, why are you criticizing, you know, UBI? Or, you know, they're conflating UBI with Yang's specific version of it. And problem is it's just it's very short-sighted you need a holistic um solution to deal with all of these uh systemic inequalities um anything else before break will uh just i want to add like exactly what you said about the needless bureaucratic jobs um over the summer i worked as an administrative assistant at uh, a car dealership up north and it was exactly that a bureaucratic job i was sitting there all day every day thinking the only reason a robot is not doing this job is because some of our customers are, you know, senior citizens who would be uncomfortable touching a touch screen. But as soon as we get to a point where everyone's comfortable walking into a dealership or, you know, a body shop and typing in what they need on a touch screen, that job's gone. Yep, exactly. All right. Uh, so I think with that, let's uh, we're going to go ahead and, and uh, go to break. Uh, I think when we get back, maybe we'll start uh, talking about some local issues. Uh, we, will, we will confer and get back to you. Y'all are listening to the Hood Rat Strategist radio program only on 89.1 WIDR Kalamazoo. Your only source for political revolution. WIDR means personality, and we've got... Depression can take many forms. It can feel like static in your brain, or as if everything around you has lost meaning. It can debilitate even the strongest of people. 89.1 WIDR is here to tell you that there is help and a way to improve mental health. WMU offers counseling for all students in the greater Kalamazoo community at Syracuse Health Center. There is no need for an appointment for first-time visits. Open counseling times are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Friday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. or Thursday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Syracuse is located at 1903 West Michigan Avenue, Kalamazoo. For more information, please call 269-387-3287 or visit www.wmitch.edu backslash health center.
Hello, everyone. We are back. This is the Hood Rat Strategist radio program, only on 89.1 WIDR. Of course, uh, if you don't know, if you're just tuning in, um, and especially if you're a new student, this is uh, Wider's resident uh, radical socialist uh, leftist uh, uh, radio program. Uh, so uh, now that we're back, we've got a couple of issues to talk about uh, involving um, actually in, in indigenous sovereignty uh, right here in Kalamazoo. Uh, I want to let I'll let Will lead off. Uh, we'll give you the good news and then the bad news. How about that? <laughs> so uh, I'm going to let Will talk about this as something involving the university. Is that correct? Uh, yes, it is. All right. So the good news. Um, last week at the Board of Trustees meeting, um, the university's Board of Trustees voted to approve a land acknowledgement. And what that is, Michigan State already has one, is simply a statement that acknowledges in essence, that this university is built on stolen land. Um, it doesn't unsteal the land, but at least, you know, someone's acknowledging it, so that's nice. Uh, the full statement reads, uh, We would like to recognize Western Michigan University is located on lands historically occupied by Ojibwe, Odawa, and Badawatomi nations. Please take a moment to acknowledge and honor this ancestral land of the Three Fires Confederacy, the sacred lands of all indigenous peoples, and their continued presence. It was a very classy of WMU. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, I always tell people, actually, we're about to do a story about a resolution. And a lot of people, uh, a lot of people I talk to in the community, they're like, oh, well, these statements, you know, they don't really mean much and all that stuff. And, you know, it, it really depends on the context. Uh, you know, I think, you know, something you got to really take in mind or keep in mind is that, you know, particularly a lot of indigenous issues have just been, uh, you know, it feels like we got to a point um, after the mid mid late seventies where we stopped uh, the overt state oppression of uh, native uh, spirituality. Like it was literally illegal to practice most native religions until uh, that late in American history. Um, you know, uh, people neglect the fact that you know what, you know indigenous people are still being oppressed today. Uh, they face poverty and. Uh, um, disproportionate murder rates from law enforcement that are uh, up there uh, with a lot of the African American population and, and in certain uh, uh, areas actually surpass. Uh, so, you know, I think it's uh, important to acknowledge these things because one, it acknowledges the fact that like there's been a lot of historical trauma that indigenous folks have been subject to from colonialism uh, here in the United States and it is an ongoing legacy and it's what you know what helps with i think from you know from my perspective is it shows that you know uh it expresses to a community like indigenous folks here in west michigan that you know we acknowledge you know uh this this historical travesty this historical injustice um we we apologize and we stand with you to a certain extent so uh yeah you know i think i think it is important for the university to come out and say that it is and something that should be noted is that this statement was um actually originally created by grad students um here at the university but they actually worked with the three fires confederacy in drafting it um so it wasn't just a, a one-sided thing um and it was actually kind of cool to witness representatives from the tribes uh, actually presented president montgomery with um, a native american blanket so that's pretty yeah. interesting to see. Well, that's yeah, that's really critical too, because you know, I because th you know that involvement is critical. Otherwise, it's uh, yeah, it, just without conferring uh, with native tribes, and we're about to talk about a story that that kind of involves this too. But if you don't confer, uh, you know, with the indigenous tribes and the, the native folks who still live around here, it, it does kind of feel like the white institution is just sending you a note. It's like, hey, sorry about all the genocide. Our bad. Mm. Uh, no, I mean, there's, there's a, a, what's, I can't remember the term, but it's like kind of, um, you know, generational healing needs to take place. And just a, a quick apology and then just blinders in the future. That doesn't really cut it. Um, it's actually a big problem with a lot of um, uh, a lot of American uh, institutions and culture is, you know, hist a lot of a lot of folks, history just exists in a vacuum. Like, you know, it's like some stuff happened back then, but this is now. What happens in the future is completely different from whatever is going to happen today. It's like, no, history, history informs the present world. 
history informs the future, the present informs the future. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's time that we really acknowledge that in a, in a very important and critical way that will actually allow us to try to kind of heal and create a better, better, better culture all around here in the U- U.S. of A. And right here in Michigan as well. So uh, tied into this, uh, you know, WMU, um, you know, we just gave them some kudos. Well, here's here's some bad news. Uh, there was there was a really bad, really bad goof up downtown uh, the other day, and uh, just a little so just a little personal anecdote. So I'm um, uh, Monday. I'm going down to the city commission meeting. I'm on the bus uh, coming home, coming from work, and uh, my phone starts blowing up. Like almost at, like I, a couple of like native organizers I know they're like Andy what 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 the what the H E double hockey sticks is going on downtown and it's like I was like what what's going on it's like they're removing the mound I'm like what and I remember like just sprinting off the bus and uh, actually from a distance it looked like it had been completely unearthed and I was, I was just like Whoa. and then I get up to it and it's like it looked like grass had been replanted and I'm just like what what is, okay what's going on so I did find out precisely what happened and uh the kind of good news i mean i don't even know if you really call it the, like the uh the acceptable news is that the city was not purposefully uh removing the sacred burial mound from bronson park uh but uh it, it's still pretty bad i'll go ahead i'm gonna read a little bit from the M live article and then we'll talk about it a bit um <clears throat> Uh, contractor mistakenly excavates around Native American Mound in Kalamazoo. Uh, it was written by Brad uh, Devereaux. It was uh, posted or published yesterday on M Live slash The Gazette. <clears throat> An excavating company mistakenly removed grass and topsoil from a historic mound in Bronson Park this week, though damage to the site is believed to be minor, a Kalamazoo City official said. Kalamazoo City Manager Jim Ritzema talked about the mound. Uh, believed to be originally associated with a Native American tribe during the September 16th City Commission meeting after a question about the issue was raised by an attendee. Uh, by the way, I was the attendee who did that. I was a, uh, kids, look up for you. Anyway, uh, he goes on to say, they made a terrible mistake, Ritzema said, explaining a contractor began excavating what they thought was a mound of dirt that needed to be excavated, mistakenly excavating around the historical mound. The mound is located near the southwest corner of Bronson Park, near the stage and intersection of South Park and West South Streets in downtown Kalamazoo. It is within view out the front windows of City Hall. The city said the incident caused minor damage to the lawn and topsail the earth mound. Grass was removed from the mound, Ritzma said. The mound itself was not disturbed, he said. The contractor has since put the topsoil back into place, reshaped the soil to its original shape, and placed grass seed in the damaged areas, the city said. A temporary fence surrounded the mound since Monday afternoon. (coughs) Kalamazoo officials informed representatives of uh, the Machi Binashiwish Band of Potawatomi Indians, the Gun Lake Tribe, about the incident. A call to the tribe was not immediately to return on September 17th. City of Kalamazoo is committed to working with the Gun Lake Tribe to preserve the mound's heritage and history and to providing educational opportunities in Bronson Park regarding the history of the Machiniba, oh, sorry, Machibinashiwish Band of Potawatomi Indians, the city said in a statement about the incident. incident. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, that's, that's really about it. If you want to find the full article, you can find it on MLive. Um, <clears throat> contractor mistakenly excavates around Native American Mound in Kalamazoo, and uh, actually the very next day, uh, some indigenous folks uh, kind of uh, sh- came 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 by and uh, you know played some uh, uh, traditional uh, indigenous music around it. I, I believe is kind of spiritual and uh, ceremonial and significance uh, significance. Sorry. Um, so, you know. Okay, so here, here's here's the main issue with this. Uh, I'm, you know, the city. This is this is a really bad accident. The contractor himself, you know, I heard this uh, from people actually there was was just stricken sick about touching this spiritual mound. It wasn't like some white supremacist with a tractor just came by and was like, <laughs> "Screw your mound, make America great." Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, you know, I, and I know firsthand, the city has been told about this mound. The city has been 
advised by many activists in the area and indigenous folks that there needs to be some kind of signage, some kind of barrier next to this mound um, in order to make sure that something like this does not happen. And unfortunately, those calls went unheeded and something like this was allowed to happen. Mm. Uh, Will, any, any thoughts? or? I think what you're really hitting on is the fact that this city and my also say just the schools in the area really need to make it clear what this mound is and you know like acknowledge how important it is because personally i wouldn't have known of the mound significance if it weren't for the fact that um, one of the history professors here i don't remember who assigned a, a paper essentially on the history of native americans and indigenous people in the area and talked about the mound in class but Otherwise, it seems like people around here just don't talk about it, don't acknowledge it um, at all. It's just sort of the mound in Bronson Park. But for these people, it's so much more than that. It's so important. And like you said, it's not necessarily the contractor's fault. He was torn up about it, as you said. You know, It just, there shouldn't be the possibility for something like this to happen, I guess. like They should have foreseen mm -hmm. this. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it, I guess the big problem for me is, you know, it seems to be, uh, and this happens a lot, you know, not just Kalamazoo, a lot of cities have this problem. Everything gets kind of caught up in bureaucracy where there's a lot of, there's, I mean, there's a very simple solution for this. Just put up a fence around it. <laughs> you know, um, and granted, I know there's this whole master plan around the project that's actually going to do some good work in educating people. There's going to be educational plaques talking about, um, you know, the indigenous history of Bronson Park and Mount in particular. But, um, you know, it almost feels to me like the city was waiting for that piece to happen, which, again, is, I believe, still about a year, year and a half out uh, while. You know, at the same time, people were like, you know, uh, I remember I had some discussions with uh, my friend Eugene. He's been a guest on the show uh, several times. And he talks about, like, there's just a lot of uh, just de facto desecration of the mound. Um, you know, not necessarily from, like, a tractor or a bulldozer, but, um, you know, people just being, you know, not being properly respectful uh, towards it. Not, you know, it's, uh, you know, people, and, you know, not a lot of Kalamazooians are like this, but... Uh, some of them are. They just they they think it's no big deal. They think what's what's the big problem, and it's like you know try to put it in these concrete terms. You know people understand. What if what if that was like your you know your ancestors' cemetery? What if that was you know um, some sort of you know memorial that is sacred to you? Uh, that is the same for these folks, and you know you can't you can't dismiss it. And again, you know. Um, if this if this were a Christian cemetery, this wouldn't have happened. This bottom line, and that's part of the problem. <laughs> All right, so we're about at six fifty eight here. Um, so, uh, Will, uh, I know you said you had to leave around seven o'clock. Um, were there any other topics you really wanted to hit on before uh, you, you you made your exit stage left? <laughs> no, yeah, actually, um, I had the opportunity to take today to um, talk to a woman uh, her name is Emily I'm not going to attempt to say her last name um, out of respect because I'll get it wrong uh, but she founded it's the refugee uh, outreach uh, collective I had an opportunity to talk to her uh, about that and a point she had hit on that I had never considered before and admittedly I'm young um, but I just think bears repeating as we talk about um refugees and refugee crisis especially today uh, newsweek posted a story a man was deported to mexico five hours later he was kidnapped by the cartel less than five hours after being deported um, and he was gone so as we continue to have these discussions she brought up the fact that she doesn't actually like the term refugee simply because it creates this idea of well this group of people have a reason to want to come to this country and, but these group of people know they're just immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, and something I didn't know about was just how strict the UN's um, idea of what a refugee is. If you're fleeing your country because there's no food, like there's a drought or something, you're not a refugee. You basically really? have to mm -hmm. be fleeing political violence. And 
that really struck out to me and seemed especially concerning as we see with climate change and stuff. Oh yeah, everything's because that is that is basically what that's the that's the actual. That's going to be the definition of a climate refugee. It's like the place I live is no longer livable. And, you know, it doesn't really matter how good or bad your government is if, you know, if a place is too hot to live or it's no longer growing crops or it's underwater, then, yeah, you're going to have to seek refuge somewhere. Exactly. And um, when you look at the studies of the causes of the refugees from Syria that are coming to Europe, yes, there's the Syrian civil war. But a big factor that's not talked about that preceded the Civil War and is still going on is that Syria is experiencing a massive, massive drought. And I don't want to say that's responsible for the Civil War, but when there's not enough food to go around, people get angry. You know, um, I actually do want to make that connection because I'm I'm really glad you brought that up because... uh uh, there actually has been a lot of correlation between the fact that, like, a lot of these generational farmers, they have, like, younger people who they can no long, longer farm this land because the drought is so long to sustain. They go into the cities. Um, there's not enough jobs in the cities. There's not enough food in the cities. And, you know, this is you see this in societies throughout history um, when a bunch of young people um, no longer are g- tied to the you know generational work of tilling the land that they, you know, did for generations um they are displaced put into a new environment that's much harsher and that does not offer the resources even that they hope that they would gain it makes it that much easier for them to radicalize and honestly you know a big part of it is like isis if they're offering three squares a day and some stipend money to send back to your family that's going to sound pretty good (laughs) it really does and it's something um that sort of bothers me is A hypocrisy I see um, amongst not just the far right, but the center right that's not going to call out the far right. Because you see these mass shooters on the far right, and when we discuss the psychology of them, it always comes up that, oh, well, they didn't have these opportunities that their parents had and economic anxiety and all that. And admittedly, that may be a part of it. But then when we look at terrorism, you know, that is committed by people with slightly darker pigmentation to their skin it's not economic anxiety or things like that that cause it it's no oh they're just wacko nut jobs like but these things have causes um i'm actually taking right now a class on terrorism and political violence and the big takeaway i'm getting from it is that we need to realize they're just people like you you can understand them they are just people yeah that's right uh you know some we talk a lot about uh the intercept did it really brilliant article a couple years ago which is kind of exposing the hypocrisy of how you know even democratic and republican administrations portray uh radical islamic terrorism is like oh they just they're crazy people who hate our freedoms and you know they uh they pointed out like the uh the um it was the manifesto from the shoe bomber and you know what they basically pointed out is like if you read it He's talking about American foreign policy. He's not talking about like abstract ideas like, you know, I hate you for your freedom or, you know, just talking in explicitly religious terms. It's I don't like, you know, the Americans policy in towards Palestinians and, you know, there's a laundry list of stuff. But there, there are reasons. There are logical reasons that this person did this thing. And, uh, you know, by just dismissing them as like, oh, they're just crazy. They're a lunatic. You're not getting to the actual root of these problems or of why you know both uh, white supremacists or islamic jihadists why they radicalize in the first place exactly you're not and then just another point this i actually read today is one in five reproductive health clinics will experience some sort of violence by christian militants but then there's the term christian militants why aren't they called christian terrorists we talk about you know Muslim terrorists, like, that's a term that is used in the media, but never Christian terrorists. By the way, if we were CNN, Fox News, or MSNBC, by now you would hear a pundit asking, well, what about the Antifa and their milkshakes? (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, But, but, um, yeah, that that, that whole double standard is a discussion unto itself. It is. (laughs) Uh, I don't want to dwell too much on it. It's just uh, came up today and seemed important to talk about. 
All right. Well, uh, I think with that, we're going to go ahead and take a break. Again, I want to thank Will for uh, coming on and joining the show and being a valuable member of our uh, uh, analytical team here. You know? Uh, so I think with that, let's go ahead. We're going to take a little bit of a break. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about more local news. We're going to uh, share some uh, information about the tensions with Iran. And then later on in the program, around 730, we're going to be having an interview with a couple folks about the climate strike coming up here on campus and downtown this Friday. Keep your dial locked. This is the Hood Rat Strategist radio program, only on 89.1 WIDR Kalamazoo. Your only source for political revolution. Hello, everyone. We are back. This is the Hood Rat Strategist radio program, only on 89.1 WIDR Kalamazoo, your only source for political revolution. So if you're just joining us, uh, again, this is a political talk show here on WIDR Kalamazoo, uh, kind of examines local, national, and international issues from a analytical leftist perspective. So want to hit on real quick a uh, bit of good news before we go in and uh, I want to cover the uh, GM strikes and then I also want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, what's going on in Iran so I want to give props to Kosecha yesterday the county commission approved a resolution uh, in support of undocumented Michigan residents seeking eligibility for driver's licenses Um, I'm just going to read a couple of excerpts from it um uh, Victoria Marsetti was quoted in the article. She's a local advocate, and uh, uh, she said, uh, Imagine if every time you had to go to work or to the store, you were risking never seeing your family again. Um, important to bring up, uh, as we said last time. Uh, again, it was only until very recently 
uh, that uh, this was perfectly legal for undocumented folks to get driver's licenses. So we're basically trying to go to a back to a pre-Rick Snyder status quo here. Um, the only vote against the motion came from Republican John Gisler, represents District 8. Uh, Gisler said that while he understands that some undocumented families come to America for better opportunities, and he himself might do the same if he were in their shoes, he could not support something illegal. It's against the law, Gisler said, and I support law and order. Um, I'm not going to... Y- y'all know how, how Gisler is. Uh, well, maybe you don't, but he is uh, definitely the conservative guy on the commission, uh, no doubt. Um and uh, I don't know. I just I hate this 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 talking point because you know a lot of things were um, you know against the law. Uh, har- harboring Jews uh, was against the law in World War II if you lived in Germany. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a big difference between what is lawful and what is moral. I think in this case it's pretty clear cut. So, uh, but I just did want to uh, say like that was some good news. We got that passed. Yes. Now, uh, let's see what is going on the east side of the state. Our comrades over at the UAW. Uh, so I wanted to bring up some. This just uh, this is a, this reminds me of childish Gambino song. This is America, uh, and um, <laughs> uh, the headline here just says it all. Strike at GM shifts health insurance burden from company to the UAW. This was published uh, yesterday. It's written by Ron Fonger. And uh, I want to just read a little bit from it, and then I'll explain just how, how just distinctly American this is. UAW members in Flint, Michigan, who went out on strike against General Motors this week, are getting a quick reminder that they left some benefits, including some insurance coverage, when they walked off the job. It, uh, I don't really like the way that's written, but anyway, UAW Local 651 in Flint posted a notice to members on Facebook Tuesday, September 17th, saying General Motors has ended our medical, dental, and vision insurance along with prescription coverage. Effective yesterday, September 16th. The Flint Journal could not immediately reach a spokesman for the UAW International Union on Monday, but the union's website also notes that the UAW strike fund would cover medical insurance and prescriptive dr- pre- prescription drug coverage during the strike, but not dental, vision, or hearing insurance. GM said in a statement to the journal that both the union and company understood the insurance issues before the UAW went on strike against the company on Monday. We understand strikes are difficult and disruptive to families, GM said in its statement. While on strike, some benefits shift to being funded by the union strike fund. In this case, hourly employees are eligible for union-paid COBRA, so their health care benefits can continue. The health issue discussion came a day after Terry Dittis, vice president and director of the UAW's GM department, said in a letter that the company could conti- or would continue health care benefits through the end of the month for all UAW-represented employees as provided for in the contracts. UAW Local 659, which represents employees at the Flint Metal Center, Flint Tool and Die, and Flint Engine Operations, told members on Tuesday it has been confirmed for our members of UAW GM. UAW members do not have company-provided health care as of the commencement of the strike. GM said Tuesday that talks on the new contract are ongoing and said the company's goal remains to reach an agreement that builds a stronger future for our employees and our business. Mm. So... Let's just talk. I don't think I need to talk about how gross it is for a company to, you know, leverage people's health insurance over their heads when they're trying to demand better working conditions. I think it is worth pointing out, though, this is unique. This doesn't happen when workers, when GM workers strike in Germany or Canada or, uh, you know, uh, many, most European countries. You know why? Because those countries have universal health care. It is only in America where employers have this extra leverage to say, well, if you strike, if you go on strike, you strike out, you're going to lose your health insurance. And as we said before, um, you know, what are the options for low income, middle income people? Uh, well, that means either you shut up, put your grievances in like a little suggestion box, keep working under unworkable conditions so you can keep your health insurance. It's part of the reason workers' mobilization is so much less aggressive in this country, so much less overt, 
and on, right? You know, I think people ignore that crucial part. You know, a lot of people like to say it's like, well, we have a militarized police state, and it's like, I don't know. You, you look at uh, the Yellow Vest movement in France, they're starting to get pretty uh, militarized against them, too. No, no, no. The answer is a little bit deeper. It's that in those countries, there's enough of a social safety net that uh, a lot of workers are capable of going on strike without having to be concerned about, you know, well, if I go on strike, I'm not going to be able to afford this medication. If I go on strike, you know, what if it happens if I get hit by a car? In America, workers do have to worry about that. And it works to really stack the odds against them. With that, I want to go ahead and play a quick video clip. This is from the World Socialist website's web website. Um, sorry, there are a uh, explicitly uh, World Socialist website is an explicitly socialist um, news outlet. Um, if you're a real huge Marxist nerd, they they kind of follow the Trotskyist line. Um, anyway, uh, they interviewed several Flint workers who are going on strike and uh, again when we have a chance to hear straight from the workers mouth uh, we're going to go ahead and do that so I'm going to just go ahead and play this clip from the striking GM workers Today is day one of the strike of 46,000 General Motors workers across the United States involving 35 assemblies. Um, this is Jerry White, uh, author of an auto worker newsletter over in Flint, Michigan. ...and manufacturing plants in nine states. General Motors, which has made billions of dollars in profits, is offering a 2% wage increase, which would be more than eaten up by increasing out-of-pocket health care costs. It also wants to expand the use of brutally exploited temporary workers. Flint is the site of the historic sit-down strikes of 1936-37 and has long traditions of militant struggle by the working class. I believe it's going to be the workers of the world that are going to have to unite against the corporations and protect ourselves. It's not just the U.S. anymore or the Canadian workers. I believe it's all of us that's in the same fight. What do you think about you taking a stand not only for your generation but the future generations of workers? Well, that's what they did in the sit-down strike. I'm just following in their footsteps. I just hope that uh, someday that we're looked upon in the same vein as they, we look upon them. What's your feeling about the two-tier system? That's a disgrace. Uh, that again, that pro promotes a separation of people. It tells that there are two different classes of people, and they're not. We're all the same. And if you're doing the same job as me, then you deserve the same pay. Workers are in the dilemma in which they're fighting a corporation as they must. Yes. But the people that are supposedly negotiating on their behalf have been taking bribes from the corporation. Yes. So it's been everybody against us. Right. Literally. Even our own people. Well, it may happen like in Mexico where they end up striking against their own union. That's a possibility. And what do you think about a corporation making $25 billion in, in profits and demanding cuts in your health benefits? I think it's crazy. All, all it is is for their stockholders, and that's it. Not for their people who are slaving and working daily. Sorry. Daily, <laughs> daily. Out here waving my arm that hurts from working on the line for nine hours a day. Healthcare cuts would devastate the workers. There's so many people that I know who have medical issues that it, it'd just be unspeakable. Mm -hmm. And then them wanting to give us 2% raise, but then raise our health care 15%. So what does that tell you? That means our money is going down more than 10%. So give me a break. No, I'm over it. I'll, what about I'll be out here as long as it takes. I'm out here. What do you think about the next generation? Are you fighting also for the Absolutely. next generation? I have a nephew that just got hired in. I'm out here for him, too. He, I'm fourth generation. He's fifth generation. 
Absolutely. Wow. Well, these companies want to turn the clock backwards, though, don't they? Yes, they do. They have. The working conditions that we have now within the last two years is awful. Awful. How so? Uh, like as far as like minute late, they won't work with you over anything. Like you need to leave early for a day for some reason for your kid or you have an appointment or something. Oh no, you can't just leave. You have to, what do you mean you don't have vacation time left? Well, no, then no, you can't leave. It's ridiculous. They want to write you up and get you in trouble for every little thing imaginable. It's crazy. There's temps who's been in this plant for over five years as a temporary. They have nothing. My grandfather was a part of the sit-down strike. Wow. I have the medallion to prove it. Wow. They'd be rolling over in his grave. My dad is a retired 34 years in Buick City. Obviously, there's no more Buick City. There's nothing around here for these kids. And they want to keep on taking it away, taking it away, taking it away. I just don't know where it stops. Everybody can't live on nine, 10, $11 an hour. It's impossible. Unless you go out and get two or three jobs, you know, and it, it's crazy. If you were to talk to a worker in, in Germany or a worker in China or a worker in Mexico, who are also working for these giant corporations, what would you sell it, say to them about why American workers are fighting? What I say to them? That we're doing it for them too. They shouldn't have to work 12 hours or whatever and whatever they do. I don't know their specifics, but they gotta be with us. That's all there is. They gotta, they gotta be with us. They know what they go through in their plants and their situations, so they gotta be with us, that's all there is. I don't wanna lose our health care. I think that we've given up so much in the last 20 years I've been hired. I think that you know, it's time to stand up and, and go for what we want. And with all the corruption going on through GM and the UAW, I think it's really adding a lot to the situation that we're going through right now. People are just ready to fight for what we want benefits and wage increase it's not just about money it's not just that we want higher wages we want the temps that are next to us year after year to finally be hired and not make half the amount have days off have times with their family you know don't go after the retirees and the things that they work so hard for so uh that those were uh flint uh gm workers who are going out on strike and uh basically talking about why they're doing what they're doing and uh, the conditions that they're working under uh so with that we're gonna switch gears um uh, again i'm gonna kind of step back and play a clip uh this one's from democracy now um but from flint michigan all the way to iran uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, I wanted to inform you about what is going on uh, with the tensions with Iran. Again, uh, Democracy Now! is one of the best outlets there for out there for, uh, you know, really analytical and truthful uh, foreign policy information and news. So uh, uh, I'm not going to comment too much. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and play a clip from them. And then after that, uh, we will be having a couple of guests on to talk about the local climate strike that's going to be happening right here in Kalamazoo. Hey, Goodman. President Trump is threatening to take military action after two major Saudi Arabian oil facilities were attacked Saturday by drones and cruise missiles. President Trump tweeted Sunday, quote, Saudi Arabia oil supply was attacked. There's reason to believe that we know the culprit are locked and loaded depending on verification, but are waiting to hear from the kingdom as to who they believe was the cause of this attack and under what terms we would proceed, exclamation point. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo directly blamed Iran for carrying out what he called an unprecedented attack on the world's energy supply. Iran is denied responsibility. Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif tweeted, quote, having failed at max pressure, 
Secretary Pompeo is turning to max deceit, he said. Houthi rebels in Yemen claimed responsibility, saying it was done in retaliation for the devastating Saudi blockade in Yemen. But numerous reports indicate the attack may have come from the direction of Iraq or Iran rather than Yemen. One of the Saudi plants struck is the world's biggest petroleum processing facility. Crude oil prices soared more than 15 percent after the plant suffered heavy damage. According to one estimate, the attacks decreased Saudi's daily output by nearly six million barrels, cut it in half. While the United States has been quick to blame Iran, other world powers have not yet assigned blame. German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas said Germany is still determining who carried out the attack. The Houthis have taken responsibility for these attacks. At the moment, we're analyzing, along with our partners, who is responsible for this attack and how it could happen. We need to do so with the necessary calm, but the situation is extraordinarily worrying because this really is the last thing we need in this conflict right now. The attack came just ahead of the United States General Assembly, the United Nations General Assembly in New York. Last week, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said President Trump is open to meeting with Iranian President Hassan Rouhani with no preconditions. But on Sunday, Trump blamed what he called the fake news for essentially reporting what Pompeo publicly said. To talk more about the escalating crisis in the Middle East, we're joined by two guests. Here in New York, Peter Salisbury is with us in the International Crisis Group. He's senior analyst for Yemen. And joining us in Washington, Medea Benjamin, co-founder of Code Pink. She was in Iran earlier this year, author of several books, including Kingdom of the Unjust, Behind the U.S.-Saudi Connection. Her latest the latest book is titled Inside Iran, The Real History and Politics of the Islamic Republic of Iran. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Peter Salisbury, let's start with you. What do you understand took place this weekend? Well, the fact that we have right now is that one of the world's largest uh, petroleum processing facilities was hit. The Houthis have claimed it. The U.S. has said publicly that they believe Iran was behind the attack. And we're now seeing U.S. officials briefing that the attack came from either Iraq or Iran. We really don't have more facts than, than these. Explain what is known at this point. What, what is known, um, again, is that the, the facility was hit. What it was hit by isn't even known yet. So initially what we were told was there were drone strikes. Now we're told that there were missile strikes. And what is possible, there was some sort of combination of both and even potentially from, from both di directions. Um, we're at a real trigger point, though, here. Um, and, and what we've seen is the U.S. Um, saying that they want the Saudis to come out and say what they think happened. And if the Saudis come out and say this was I Iran, then the expectation is that they will take some sort of retaliatory action. Well, President Trump said locked and loaded. Locked and loaded. Basically awaiting Saudi Arabia's direction. The yes. United States awaiting what Saudi Arabia is telling us to do. Absolutely. And this is reminiscent of attacks earlier this year on oil tankers off the coast of Fujairah in the United Arab Emirates, where the U.S. came out pretty strongly and said this was Iran. And the UAE, in the end, said that they could not ascertain who was behind the, the attacks because of the potential cost of retaliation against Iran that would lead in turn to retaliation against the, the UAE. So the decision point really sits with the, the Saudis right now in terms of, of what happens next. Hmm. Midia Benjamin of Code Pink in Washington, D.C., your response to what's taken place this weekend and President Trump saying the U.S. is locked and loaded and Secretary of State Pompeo. Now, mind you, the er very serious Iran hawk, not that Pompeo isn't, John Bolton was ousted last week by President Trump. And now you see this escalation of pressure on Iran. Um, if you can respond to the locked and loaded response and what took place in Saudi Arabia. Well, let's remember that Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, with the help of the United States and other Western powers that have been selling billions of dollars of weapons, have been destroying the infrastructure of Yemen for almost five years now. Of course, the Houthis uh, have been trying to fight back taking this, uh, this conflict into Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is just the most devastating of the attacks. Maybe it was done just by these $15,000 drones. 
uh, as the Houthis say, uh, maybe it was done with help from uh, other countries, but this is to be expected. But let's go back to the origin of this problem, which is the Saudis and the Emirates getting involved in the internal affairs of Yemen and the U.S. Uh, giving them the green light and all the logistical support and the weapons to do that. What we have to do now is put up the pressure more on the U.S. to stop the support. We have had historic votes in Congress, including a war powers resolution that said the U.S. should not be supporting this Saudi-led war in Yemen, and it's been vetoed by Donald Trump. Now is the time to demand that an amendment that's put into the Military Funding Act, known as the NDAA, the National De Defense Authorization Act, stay in there, and we need to put pressure on the Speaker Nancy Pelosi so that this becomes a top priority. We have to stop our support for the war in Yemen. The other thing we have to recognize is that the conflict with Iran is totally manufactured by Donald Trump and that Congress must reiterate what's in the Constitution. He does not have the right uh, to take military action against Iran. That is the right of the Congress. And certainly, Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia is not the commander of chief of the U.S. forces. Mm. Um, Peter Salisbury, you've suggested the real danger in this situation is that the U.S. sees Yemen and the Houthis as a uh, kind of um, easy means to attack Iran. And explain what that means for the people of Yemen. Sure, that's right. So, so earlier this year, we, we published a, a fairly lengthy report um, on the dangers of Yemen becoming increasingly embroiled in tensions between the United States, Saudi Arabia on one hand, and, and Iran on the other. The Yemen conflict is resolvable through political means, through an imperfect solution, an imperfect deal of some kind. And what we said was, if the war is allowed to continue, if there is no diplomatic process to end the war, which involves Saudi Arabia and the US speaking to the Houthis, the, the rebel group that, that hold the capital, then the, the big danger is that in fact we see Yemen becoming a trigger point for a wider regional war and being further embroiled in some form of confrontation and the US perhaps deciding, as has been suggested to us, is, is a possibility that it should support the Saudis more in, in their military campaign in Yemen to hurt the Houthis more, to hurt Iran by extension. And we see that as a, a really dangerous path to be going down. And explain the devastating impact of the U.S. armed uh, Saudi and UAE, though UAE says they're pulling out, attacks on Yemen. What's happening on the ground, the number of deaths, the um, cholera and everything else. I mean, the, the really simple answer is that you've got 18 million people in a country of 26 to 30 million people who don't get enough to eat on a day-to-day -day basis. 11 million people are really on the brink of starvation and around half a million people literally starving as a consequence of, of the war as, as a whole. You've got sort of people using the, the economy as a weapon of war. You're seeing all parties to the conflict bombing civilian areas, infrastructure being devastated. We're seeing a, a country which if you stop the war tomorrow, it's going to be hungry, it's going to be poor, and it's going to be devastated for some time to, to come. But the other point to, to understand here is all parties have used the economy, have attacked civilians to, to further their aims, and none have been successful thus far. So when we talk about pursuing a, a deeper military path, perhaps deeper U.S. Um, involvement in the, the conflict, what we're talking about is doubling down on a strategy that simply has not worked up until now. And again, sort of as, as crisis group, as an organization that promotes peace, what we've been saying for some time is it's time for everyone to talk. It's time for people to sort of rip off the, the band-aid, stop hiding behind UN resolutions, and for the U.S., the Saudis, to talk to the Houthis and see what can be, be done to end the, the conflict. And absent that kind of step, I think we're just going to see things get worse. And what worse. happened to the UAE? So I think that's probably a good place to leave that clip. Again, if you want to see the full, uh, full clip there, um, that is on Democracy Now!'s website. Uh, Saudi oil refinery attack raises fears of wider regional war involving U.S. and Iran. That was published September 16th, 2019. So we're going to take a quick little break. When we come back, we're going to be joined with a couple of the organizers from the climate strike here in Kalamazoo. So keep your dial locked. Y'all listening to the Hood Rat Strategist radio program, your only source for political revolution.
you know what they call a, a quarter pounder with cheese uh, in there? W-I-D-R, Kalamazoo. This is a tasty burger. Voting is important. From deciding Kalamazoo's best drunk food to picking the fan favorite for Wider's Battle of the Bands, voting allows people to voice their opinions and change their world. To vote for offices such as mayors, senators, and the president takes a little more than a link to a Google Form survey. Before you vote, you have to register. This can be done in person, by mail, and in many states, online. For more information, you can point your favorite web browser to vote.gov. back this is the hood rat strategist radio program uh so we are now joined by a couple of guests uh here at the university uh megan and tyler they are here they are helping to organize the climate strike here on campus so uh i think first of course uh let's just have them introduce themselves um kind of uh I guess uh, Megan will start with you, and then Tyler, and just you know, tell us uh, you know your name, your your blood type, your occupation. <laughs> no, no, uh, t- just no. Tell us, uh, tell us just uh, who you are and how you got involved in organizing uh, kind of the local climate action that we're having here uh, at Western. All right, um, my name is Megan Nippa. I'm a junior here at Western. Um, I'm studying environmental studies and biology, and I have a minor in climate change studies. Um, I have always just been really passionate about spending time outside, being in nature, and I want to fight for that and stick up for what I love. Tyler? Um, So yeah, my name is uh, Tyler Boos, and um, I'm a fourth year student at Western, and I major in uh, economics and uh, applied math. And um, for me, it's a little bit different. Um, So I'm actually the student intern for a um, a group in Kalamazoo called Kalamazoo Nonviolence Opponents of War, and yeah, um, basically we were talking about you know um, how imperialism is connected to the climate uh, change issue, and then we got connected with a group called that ended up becoming the Kalamazoo Climate Crisis Coalition, the K uh, C for short, and I started working with them in July to organize a strike in Kalamazoo, and then they wanted. Um, Megan and I to kind of take charge in terms of organizing the um, a march at campus to where our climate strike event would be in Kalamazoo so that's you know we could have a student event for it. Yeah and um, I'm also part of Students for Sustainable Earth which is also involved in the um, Kalamazoo Climate Crisis Coalition group. Um, yeah so yeah it's basically a group of like I don't know like 20 plus activist groups in the area regarding the climate crisis and we all kind of came together in July to like get a huge strike planned in the Kalamazoo area by the way I just it, it warms my heart um, those of you on the show know I'm 32 years old and uh, when I was y'all's age uh, I didn't become an actual community organizer until I was about 28 and uh, before that I was just uh, I'll just I'll just write some rap songs about about the government and the in the in the capitalists and stuff and it's like oh my my job is done there um anyway uh <laughs> so um and, and you know by the way you know i thank you for working with know uh, i mean i'm sure the solution let's just throw some sol- solar panels on the drones um <laughs> so uh, uh let me just ask too so uh you know one great work that you're uh, getting involved so what um <clears throat> So, uh, you know, I want to dive a little bit deeper. It sounds like both of you are coming at this from, from different angles. Uh, you know, what what is it just e- individually, you know, what are some of the things that, like, strike you about the climate crisis that made, like, drew you to action? 
And uh, can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, kind of maybe what was what was the moment you, when you realized that we had this kind of, uh, you know, existential apocalyptic crisis on our hands? And uh, when did you decide to do something about it? Um, so for me, it was kind of when I well, first, my um, diving into like apocalyptic topics, you know, was the issue of war and the fact that we have so many nuclear weapons around the world that it's just a ticking time bomb before that goes off. And you know, so I started thinking into stuff like, you know, looking into stuff like the doomsday clock. And I realized really climate change and the, you know, the climate crisis is really just as big of an existential threat. And really, it's kind of tied to militarism because, you know, the Pentagon emits 1.2 billion tons of greenhouse gases every year, mm -hmm. more than any institution on the planet. Yet both major political parties in our country, the Republicans and Democrats, the only thing they seem like they can agree on is the fact that we need to increase the Pentagon spending every year, even though it's driving our climate catastrophe. And also, a majority of our military efforts are used to just protect oil interests. Like, if you think, I mean, you were just talking earlier about Saudi Arabia and Iran, you know, we supply Saudi Arabia with billions of dollars in weapons, you know, and they, you know, they protect a lot of our oil interests in the region. And so they're two connected issues. And the politicians who are in charge are just explicitly lying. Like, they're lying about the urgency that we have for the climate crisis. They're lying when they say they're going to bring the troops home because they never do. And so when I realized that there's like that mass corruption that's literally going to end our world, um, that really made me concerned. So I started kind of focusing on the climate crisis as well as imperialism as like kind of activism focuses. Yeah. Uh, uh, Megan. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like I said, for me, I have always been kind of more focused on the natural environment and the effects um, that the climate has on it. And I guess uh, just seeing the effects that climate change can have on ecosystems, which affect us as humans, too, um, it's obvious that we need to like make a change for the organisms that can't help themselves, as well as um, people of color and people of lower income who... Um, that's kind of a different topic, I guess, but... Um, oh, yeah, yeah. It, is, it is uh very much somewhat... We talk a lot about... Um, uh, oh, sorry, what's the term? Uh, look, you know, hey, the, 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 those who have the least uh, in, uh, responsibility for creating this crisis are the ones who are going to experience it exactly, first. Exactly, <laughs> yes. And um, there's this concept of climate gentrification that's as more climate issues arise, people of color and people of lower income are going to be displaced by people who have more money white people too and lose their possessions their land because of this crisis yeah you know uh it, it that's definitely true and uh you know um i was wondering if you could expand to uh a little bit um you know a lot of, i think a lot of confusion gets around um you know we've got we always consistently get new estimates about you know uh how many years we have left like what what is actually tangibly uh, going to happen. I know you, you, you said like you have a background that you're in a uh, climate climate science um, Can you talk a little bit about like, you know, what what are we looking at like, you know, in a, in a very like concrete way? Yeah, so um, staying on the topic of where we live in our home um, as Temperatures continue to increase increase sea levels will continue to rise and that will obviously displace a lot of coastal communities And that's already started happening in small islands across the world who obviously aren't contributing to the problem But are more affected by it than those who are and um Yeah, um lower uh, or Sorry um, like the median the annual number of flood days um, doubled from 2005 to 2015 on parts of the East Coast and that's showing really how like much this problem is increasing and yeah and uh, along those lines um, those the rain and the the um, well, you know, I think, uh, you know, when you talk about uh, rainfall in particular, you know, that's something that I think hits really close to home here. Uh, uh, you know, um, just just to interject real quick. Uh, I've uh, I've talked to a lot of um, kind of local climate scientists who uh, it's like kind of their job to figure out, you know, what's um, 
what the environment biosphere might be looking at is going to look like years down the road. Something that always crops up is heavy and sustained rain events. And even here in Kalamazoo, we're already starting to see levels of flooding and consistent flooding during the summer months that is, is really unprecedented for anybody who's lived here their whole lives. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And well, one additional thing is is um, something else I work with a lot is the refugee community, which I'm, I'm vice president for WMU's uh, Refugee Outreach Collective on campus. And one thing that's going to happen is a mass refugee crisis, even bigger than now, is going to happen because of the climate crisis. Like um, recently, I, I forgot what year it was, but now climate issues are the number one cause of like displacing people around the world. And what's going to happen is is like you think now where we have this distaste towards immigrants is like problematic it's going to get even worse when we have you know fl- more and more immigrants coming here because of climate change and you know right now we have a president who doesn't even believe in climate change he doesn't believe that immigrants should be here and we're going to have issues when you know right now you can see like on the equator like it's getting like less and less in- inhabited like the closer you get even starting today and you know, if we don't acknowledge that like climate change is like an existential threat and that we need to help everyone in the world, not just, you know, like as Megan was saying, just, you know, the white people in America, we need to help everyone. And if we don't acknowledge that, then like the whole society is just gonna crumble. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's that's very true. Um, You know, I think, let, let, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about that. Um, so most of you are very clear-eyed about, you know, the, the scale of the crisis that mm-hmm. we're looking at. Uh, and, you know, you're both a little bit younger than I am. Um, and, you know, we've the it really does seem, you know, part of the reason the climate strike is being started, you know, in schools. You know, you have uh, Gre- uh, Greta Thunberg, who's mm-hmm. uh, been doing a lot of... Well, you know, it's funny because, like, herself, she'll admit, like, the only thing I'm really doing is just, you know calling it what it is you know hey everybody you know to quote uh public enemy armageddon it's been in effect so uh, just from your own perspectives why do you think it is that you know millennials and generation z have so much uh, kind of a clearer vision on what this crisis is than you know either like institutional politicians or older folks uh, you know wh- why do you think that is well i think um people who were growing up in times when this wasn't as central of an issue have a hard time accepting that times are different than they were when they were like coming of age and now we are growing up in the midst of this problem and seeing all of the impacts it's having on people around us on the environment and there's just we are really like the ones that are going to have to deal with it in the end because the people that are older than us are not and they're leaving it to us. Yeah, I've noticed also, like, from, I mean, since, you know, quote unquote older people control our society, you know, I've noticed, like, from, like, politicians and the media, you know, they aren't necessarily gonna be affected. They're all just in their penthouses right now, getting to say whatever they want, you know, and um, we really don't, they're not really talking about the issue, you know. You have, like I said, the Republicans are being led by a president who doesn't believe in climate change. The Democrats are being are a party that, you know, voted 222 to 137 to not have a climate debate. And then also, um, the media, the last uh, presidential debate only talked about climate change for around seven minutes. And the candidate with the biggest climate plan um, didn't even get asked about it. Like, you know, like Bernie Sanders had a $16.3 trillion climate plan. That's probably not enough to solve the issue, but it's by far the greatest that's ever been proposed. And he was not asked about it once at the recent presidential debates. So, like, who are these, um, you know, politicians and media, like, who are they trying to please? They're not trying to please us who are going to be living in this planet someday. They're trying to please, I mean, money interests, most likely, you know? It's not like, I mean, that's really the way it is, you know? And uh, 70% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from just 100 companies. So it's the large corporations that we need to target in this. And obviously making small differences in our daily lives is important too, but I think that will kind of come with systematic change um, and legislation put into place that holds these corporations accountable. Yeah, I mean, like, if you think about it, like when, you know, a dictator commits like a genocide and like kills millions of people, you know, they are usually held accountable by the rest of the world or, you know, I mean, 
obviously the U.S. has its own interests in terms of militarism, but like um, fossil fuel companies knew that climate change would be an issue 40 mm. years ago. Like yeah, I knew, yeah. I, I, I read, Exxon, I read somewhere that like Exxon scientists or some Exxon Mobil scientists knew about the climate crisis would come about. Like 40 years ago, they knew about this, and they chose to continue polluting and killing our future generations. So we need to be holding these corporations criminally accountable, not just like a little cuts around the edges. We need to be telling them, we will not let you destroy our planet. We want to have a future and um, we're going to do whatever we can to make sure we have a future. Oh, yeah. I, hey, I like that. Let's talk after the show. I've got some uh, revolutionary literature <laughs> to give you. Um, <laughs> no, uh, so uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, so Megan, I want to kind of pose this question to you. Uh, you know, something I think gets left out a lot. Um, you know, I, I've, I have a lot of friends who organize across the states, and uh, I remember there, there's one particular, you know, I, I had some conversations with them about the climate crisis, and they were uh, um, uh, like a, a, a zoo. A zoo I'm sorry, I'm going to. It's an animal biologist. Uh, there's an actual. Yeah, yeah, there's an actual <laughs> term, sorry. Um, but, uh, you know, he mentioned, like, you know, it's like the sad thing is, like, if you're going into the science field, particularly now, you kind of you start seeing this degradation in real time and I was wondering just as a student is this is there like maybe like a specific thing that comes to mind when you're thinking about like you know maybe in your own research either like in the field or just you know um, you know ink and paper where you've really seen the impact of the climate crisis firsthand yeah actually the thing about that is we don't know a lot about how climate change is going to affect the environment um, ecology is a fairly new science like 90s not like it became a lot more popularized. Don't quote me on that, but um, <laughs> yeah, so we are, I personally wanna um, go into studying ecology for like specifically like wild wilderness preservation biology and um, do research on the kind of effects that climate change has on these ecosystems because we don't have a ton of knowledge on it. We have um, a lot of, we're, we're kind of focusing a lot on how it affects agriculture because that's what makes us money, obviously. And um, that will be uh, greatly affected by climate change. Um, as we mentioned before, the flooding, as um, that c becomes more intense, also there will be like more chemicals in this water that can damage crops and water supplies. Um, fruits and vegetables are actually predicted to become less nutritious even because uh, with increased CO2 production it'll actually increase photosynthesis uh, like speed which will produce wow. more sugar and less nutrients like calcium zinc and um, that's actually predicted to lead to 175 million more people with zinc deficiency and 122 million more people with protein deficiency by 2050. Wow oof I'm sorry. That's just, that's something I wouldn't have even thought about. So, you know, I, I do spend a little bit of time thinking about like, oh, what, you know, what can we do to like, you know, sustainably crop uh, you know, in the future? And uh, man, yeah, it, I think it's just people. It's it's hard to really get your hands around the scale of this problem and just how it's going to affect so many of these these you know factors that a lot of people you know, um, you know especially lay people wouldn't even think about, but. Um, uh, I wanted to kind of touch on you. You mentioned something really important, um, and I want to kind of talk to both of you about it. You know, it's um, was it ten or hundred companies you said that uh, mm -hmm. um, really are producing most of the fossil fuel. And you know, most of what we hear in the mainstream media, if they talk about climate at all, it's like you know, don't use your plastic mm -hmm. straws. Mm -hmm. or, That's uh, exactly what I was talking yeah. about. Yeah. It's kind of a distraction from mm -hmm. the main point, which is that we are not the problem. I mean, we are. We can do things to make changes, but uh, we aren't the main cause of this issue. Yeah, if we actually end up defeating, you know, these companies that are causing the majority of the crisis, hopefully we can, like, bring about a culture that, like, is all about sustainability. Exactly. And, you know, and we want to be as sustainable as possible in our own lives, right? But, um, you know, the focus of the discussion needs to be on how government institutions and corporate institutions have just failed humanity and we need to also focus on the fact that they did so maliciously like mm -hmm. it's not like you know these uh government officials didn't have access to the research about climate science they just didn't trust the scientists or they chose not to trust the scientists because it, it would make the corporations more money so yeah. it's more so that 
we need to take down these institutions and we need to organize and like create a loud voice to them which is why we need to strike and not just like telling people to stop driving their car to work or you know not just stop drink using straws for example you know that's a that is a total distraction and it's I, it, you, it almost like gets working people off the climate change issue because it makes it so they feel like they need to lower their standard of living in order to fight the crisis and they don't they can't lower their standard of living we have people in this country who are still who are hungry like we have homeless people in this country still and you know that's not covered in the media either but like you know we need to make it about the people versus those who are destroying our environment yeah uh, and I, I wanted to mention just one quick little thing because it, it made me think of something so uh, you know, there's a recent article, uh, and it basically said, uh, you know, there's been that that whole 12 years figure mm -hmm. that's been knocked around. Is it by BBC? Yeah. Um, but uh, they said, it was like, actually, it's more like 18 months. Mm -hmm. And what they meant by that is, like, we have 18 months for an institutional solution, mm -hmm. something within the current uh, frame of government. Uh, now, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like a socialist. I'm, I'm pretty cynical about whether or not that's actually going to happen. Um, uh, I think... Uh, it, like you know, we uh, there's one maybe two candidates I'm thinking in American politics who could bring that to the table in the presidential race, but uh, you would also need that to happen in many mm -hmm. of the countries around the world. And without going the whole th thing about it, like we're really seeing the, the reemergence of you know, um, as Rosa Luxemburg said, you can either have socialism or barbarism. I think in this case, fascism is represented by people like uh, Trump, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, mm -hmm. uh, their old bond, etc. So here's a question I'm going to pose to you because this is something I think about too. Um, so eight, at the end of that 18 months, institutional solution doesn't come about. Um, what the mainstream media doesn't really say is there is one solution left and that solution is basically a global you know uh, working people's revolution and that doesn't necessarily have to be a violent one it could be mm -hmm. things like strikes so i'm just curious is this something that you know y'all have thought about as younger people oh. and mm -hmm. kind of like how much of that kind of energy and thought do you think is going to be Presence uh, when we're seeing people out Friday getting ready for this yeah, march. Yeah, actually, we have something about that. Um, so after the march, every Friday at noon, we will be having a like a series called Fridays for the Future, where we'll be talking about climate issues. I forgot exactly what room on campus it's going to be at, but it's going to be run by um, some people who have been involved with the uh, climate strike itself. And then, yeah, when it comes down to like if we end up not solving the issue in 18 months, which I mean, honestly, like hope I can only hope, but like we have Trump in the off. I mean, in white in the White House, you know, it's not like Trump's finally going to have some awakening on climate change in the next 18 months. <laughs> and America is the most powerful economy in like the history of the world. Mm -hmm. So in order for anything to change, we need to be taking the first action. So like I think stuff like a general strike needs to be something that we need to talk about. And I, I think I mean, in America, in the climate discussion, I think stuff like, you know, workers um you know revolts and stuff like that needs to be a discussion in the climate movement i think uh creating an alliance between like climate activists and workers is important because if you look at remember in um recently in france for example they had like the yellow coat movement right mm -hmm. and you know that was more of a workers movement but the media painted it as you know an anti-climate movement you know a lot of times you'll get a situation where like workers get pitted against um, the climate mm -hmm. change movement and we need to do literally the opposite we need to recognize that workers will be first affected by climate change and you know they need to be part of the people that like that's part of the solution you know workers are the solution the corporate elites have failed us already like they've been doing that for hundreds of years but like they've failed the whole planet on this issue so we need to connect workers and um, you know climate change totally like mm -hmm. Uh, Megan, is, uh, just any any thoughts on that? I just want to make sure. Actually, yeah, uh, Tyler mentioned how we, as like the most powerful economy in the world, have to set an example for the rest of the world. And I think that um, thought can be brought down to the scale of our university. And Western um, often claims to be a sustainable university, but um, a lot of their current policies aren't really. They're. We, for example, last year we had a um, 
a protest for cutting down a number of fully grown mature trees um, for the construction of some new apartments. And they uh, kind of ignored us. They lost their status as a tree campus mm -hmm. USA because of it and did it anyways. And um, we have been trying to get them to work with us or listen to us and they haven't really. And we think that as a university that talks a lot about sustainability, they should be setting an example for other universities and colleges. Yeah, I have one more thing to add to that actually. And I mean, we actually spoke with, um, you know, one of the Western newspapers or whatever about, you know, promoting this strike that's happening on campus. Which we're, you know, we're trying to get hundreds of people involved from campus, you know, and we were interviewed about it and told that we'd have the front page story for this week. And instead of having our front page story on the climate strike, there's a front page story on building new buildings on campus. Yeah, the actual, oh. the building that actually that, happened. Yeah. Like, the building uh, that we uh, protested about because yeah, of the Yeah, the building trees. they pro So how yeah. ironic is that? You know, we, we talked to them, you know, they're like, um, you know, the week before the strike, you know, you'll be on the front page of Western Herald, uh, you know, telling people where to go for the strike. And we can talk about that right out, you know, um, where people need to go to, you know, actually be involved. Um, but like... You know, the fact that, like, our university, even down to, like, the Western Herald is putting, like, money motives and profit motives above, like, the, you know, ideas such as protecting our future. So it's it's kind of ridiculous, and it's, like, it's kind of telling and that, like, the problem's institutional. You know, the fact that, like, CNN doesn't purport on climate change, it's not necessarily because everyone who works there is a bad person. Mm -hmm. It's because the in there's lots of institutional like challenges for the climate change movement because you know the companies that created the problem were all about money so it all really does come back to like money yeah you know exactly i, I believe uh you know we've kicked around that figure but i think you you were telling me earlier today was it like seven minutes of coverage yeah it was seven uh, minutes of coverage about climate change at the last democratic debate and they didn't even interview the candidate with the strongest plan Bernie once. Sanders. Yeah, so Bernie wasn't even asked a question about his climate plan, yeah. even though his Green New Deal yeah. is the only one that spends a significant amount yeah. of our budget on it. So. Whereas, also, if you would have, um, if anyone watched the um, town, town hall, hall climate change discussion, um, when you compare the candidates, Bernie Sanders has the most solid like factual plan set He actually up. trusts scientists. Yeah, he yeah. is yeah. stating the facts. He's stating what he wants to do, how much money he wants to put towards it, whereas other of like the major candidates, like Joe Biden, Biden. and yeah. Elizabeth Warren, yeah. kind of just seemed like, oh yeah, this is a real problem. We need to fix it. Yeah. But they and didn't I, really say how. I and, felt like, yeah, I yeah. mean, I felt like Warren kind of identified some of the issues, but she still doesn't go back to the fact that like profit motives and capitalism is one of the big driving forces mm, yep. in, in, you know, you know, and um, the climate issue. So it really does come back to money, and that's something we really all need to be aware of. Oh man, yeah. You know, one. I think I could, if we had time, I could probably spend another. We could, we could spend another like half hour talking about this stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really digging everything y'all had to say. Um, could you just tell the listeners at home. Uh, so if they want to attend the climate strike, the climate march, um, what, uh, how do they do that? And if they want to help out between today and Friday, is there uh, any, any way they can get plugged in? Yeah, actually, um, tonight, right after this, we're headed over to Wood Hall to have a poster making party for the strike. So you can uh, make posters to carry around. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, so Friday, uh, we want students to leave their classes at 1230 and meet at the flagpoles. And we're going to be doing chants and uh, like just pumping people up and yep. yeah, just getting as much attention as we can and getting as many people yeah, to join. If, if you're from yeah. K or Western, yeah, arrive at the flagpoles between uh, 1230 p.m. and 130 p.m. Yeah. And then our goal is to leave at 130. Yeah, at 130 we're planning on marching downtown to Arcadia Festival Center. Festival yeah. Center and there we're going to have um, a bunch of speakers, some live music, all in relation to climate change. Yeah, and, we have a rally yeah. there from 3 to 6 p.m. and there there will be tons of tables where they'll have activist groups, in, many of which involved with our KCCC group yes. that will be, you know, after this, you know, we don't want this strike to be like the final thing. We, this is a step and this is a start, you know. Next year mm -hmm. we'll have a strike, you know, yeah. we want to still do the, you know, Fridays for the Future event where we're going to want to be talking about this nonstop. Because, 
you know, I really feel like over the past like summer, you know, it's really become like the biggest issue out there because I mean, we've yeah. se- I mean, the media is actually starting to cover it yeah. to a small we're degree, just, which is good. We're just one city that's doing mm-hmm. this out of so Hundreds, many across yeah. the globe. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, we are taking part it's in something that's thing. huge, and it's just going to keep getting bigger if we put in the effort. Yeah. So if, but yeah, if students can meet between twelve thirty and one thirty at the flagpoles. That would be the best. And if you can't make it to the flagpoles, still show up at the strike between three and six p.m. And there'll be tons of great stuff there. You know, and. We encourage you to, like I said, or like Megan said, leave your job, leave your class, because the climate crisis is more important. Like, we need to place this above everything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think I mentioned it on a live stream I did the other day. It's like, you know, it's not that we want to sideline other issues, but. You know, you can't really fight for human rights if there are no humans. Uh, That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I say the same thing when it comes to uh, fighting against wars. You know, a lot of people, you know, there's no discuss. You know, I think war and climate change are, like, directly connected, you know. Yes, they do. And yep. um, the issue that no one talks about, even more so than not talking about climate change, is the fact that, like, we spend over $700 billion on our military year, and we have 800-plus mm-hmm. yeah. military bases around the world. Most of these are offensive wars, and, you know, the media doesn't cover it. They don't ask about it at debates like they should, and so, and that and climate change will actually kill humanity. So, like, mm-hmm. it makes mm-hmm. no sense that the issues that will destroy us are the ones that they don't talk about. Well, how else How else would, uh, um, you know, CNN be viable if they didn't have those Northrop Grumman ads? Uh, <laughs> okay, so... Uh, with that, uh, we should close out the show again. I want to thank both of you so much for coming on to the show to talk about the climate strike. And again, that is Friday at noon down at the Flag Bowls right here on Western Michigan University's campus. Uh, before we head out, I want to read the activist calendar for you real quick. Uh, Tomorrow at 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. over at the Arcadia Creek Festival Place, it's going to be Kalamazoo's fifth annual wellness and recovery fair. Um, if uh, Basically, there's going to be a lot of people tabling down there uh, dealing with uh, addiction and recovery issues. Again, that's from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, also tomorrow uh, from 2.30 to 4 p.m., uh, the Kalamazoo Socialist Party is going to be hosting a houseless persons forum down at Bronson Park. Um, basically, we're going to... Uh, oh, sorry. I'm wearing a lot of different hats. I'm also the chair of the Kalamazoo Socialist Party, so I'm, I don't want to say we, but I, or whatever. But anyway, <laughs> there's going to be a houseless persons forum down there tomorrow at Bronson Park, 2.30 to 4. Uh, there's going to be several of the commission and mayoral candidates down there, and it's also just going to be an opportunity for houseless citizens to... Uh, um, speak up about the issues in the community. Uh, also going on, well, again, like, you know, the climate strike, as we just talked about, um, on Saturday, September 21st, uh, over at the Invisible College down in the Vine neighborhood, um, Abort Mission, a fundraiser fest for reproductive rights, uh, music going from about 4 o'clock to 11, and uh, they're going to be raising money for the uh, 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 National Network uh, of Abortion Funds. And uh, let me make sure. Uh, oh, oh yes. Uh, no, wait. That's not in Kalamazoo. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> and let's see. On Monday, uh, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., Kalamazoo Socialist Party is hosting a uh, double feature, documentary double feature, over at uh, the Kalamazoo Public Library in the Van Dusen Room. They'll be screening... The Empire Files, Marxism 101, How Capitalism is Killing Itself with Dr. Richard Wolff, and then an episode of On Contact, The Radical Transformation of Jackson, Mississippi with Kali Okuno, and then we've got one more event I want to tell you about before I peel myself out of this chair here on Tuesday, September 24th, there is going to be the first uh, city Commission and Mayoral Candidate Forum. Well, I guess second, but uh, that's going to be over at the Edison Neighborhood Association from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, again, all of the City Commission and Mayoral Candidates are going to be there. Come down and ask questions. That's going to be it for the show today. Until next time, all y'all out there in Radio Land, keep on fighting for that revolution solution.